Dennis, good to see you. How are you, my friend? What's going on with it's you Friday. today? It's Friday. That's what's good. That's good. I like Friday. Fridays. Fridays it's are something good. Something about Fridays, like we've concluded the week, we've finished our work, right, and yes. now mm. whatever we want to do, and right? the, some, uh, you some know, amount of freedom. And that, and I have two days that if I want to do like uh, intense psychedelics, I can uh, go up and then. I'm kidding, I can't. Oh, yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was waiting for the... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do it. See, all you have to do is pause long enough, and you're whatever you just said. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Now... Uh, Actually, I'll tell you what. The inhalants. The, I know yes. that those are no longer popular, but at that's one right. point, those were, you know... Just they, were, they were... <laughs> they, they, they were big know. with the youth. They were big with the youth. Okay. All right. So... <laughs> I know we had a brief um, <clears throat> communication on text. We did. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was and, briefs, uh, not boxers. Boxers, not briefs. Uh, no, it wasn't anything like that. What it was was about what's happened in the last week or so. Area 51. Was about it's Area 51. It's all in the 51. news. People talk about this thing. All right, so um, what's your take on Area 51? You know, this happened back. When is the original time? Was this like 50s, early 50s? I guess it's this. Yeah, this was uh, at the height of uh, the communists, the Red Scare, UFOs, um, robots. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that's sort of thing. It was this, yeah, I grew up in that time. That, 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 sort of, that. that sort of, like, that sort of uh, paranoia about uh, the communists coming around and about bombs, you know, and duck and cover if you are in an atomic bomb blast and yeah hide under the desk and all that that would have really helped that would have not helped that <laughs> that whatsoever would have um, really yeah uh, i don't i'm not really sure how we survived all that but there yeah, there was a lot of and fear and this idea with the there was an alien and hmm. there were a lot of movies out then mm-hmm. i think kids and uh teenagers that kind of thing we went to a lot of movies and that was the, invasion uh, of the body snatchers oh rough mm-hmm. that was rough and what to think time, about that right? invasion of the body snatchers is that is that if if it was a fear that your neighbors could be something other than you think they are and that was sort right. of inherent in the whole communist scare anybody could be a doctor you could be a communist right right, right. so okay, it was like yeah. you know and uh, we could say that as we've come into the 21st century that maybe there uh, we've expanded this notion not only could your neighbors be a communist and you not know it you could be a communist and you not know it. So horror has become uh, an identity kind of horror. It's kind of okay, it's that, gone deeper. That, uh, that's yeah. So yeah. <laughs> we're not sure of ourselves. That's is that what good. you it's, were it's saying? Very, yeah. Because I'm not sure how that exactly <laughs> plays in. But I know what you're about to do, and I can uh, you those of those folks who've listened to our podcast before know. Yeah, yeah that, that, that includes my mom that is, and two that is, people who yeah. have uh, who are on death row. <laughs> I know. Exactly. That's about the entirety of it. <laughs> and by the way. And, this is punishing and, for them. They only have one thing they can listen to this, so it's like, is you know. Is this what they choose? And, and, you know, if they choose this, then okay. And well, one we, of them, we, need, we need to perform well, do a good job. One of them I know for a fact fired his lawyer so he could speed up the uh, execution process. I'm just saying. Right. He said, look, <laughs> okay. I'm that's no longer, let's get that's, this over with. That's where he went. <laughs> All right, so uh, this idea of Era 51 and fear, we talked about fear mm-hmm. quite a bit there, but now we're talking about this being rekindled in the news lately there was this rush and mm-hmm. a matter of fact it happened on social media i think through a couple yeah, the of people uh, were supposed to podcast uh, to, and uh, to rush area 51 and they were saying hey if the only way we're going to find out about this mm-hmm. is we have to go ourselves and uh, mm-hmm. something like a million people signed up it was yeah. incredible uh what happened i think it's actually that. supposed to happen in september right september 6th i don't know the date that could very somebody well be, said yeah. it's supposed to happen in sep maybe i'm wrong but I think they've called it off, have they not? I, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I, I realize that there was a um, government response to this and mm-hmm. warning about people showing up there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what's about to happen, but hey, yeah. here we are again. Area 51. Area 51. Area 51. Area 51. Yes, it's a... Yeah, the reprise. Mm. Well, we, okay. Here's my thought on this because... Okay, go. You know, the way to think about this is why is this something that we might be interested in? Why is why is why is our um, uh, and this it seems to be sort of a a central urban legend at least in the United right. States Area Fifty One all these sorts of things going on sure 
and we want to think about what how to sort of think about this outside of whether it is true or not but why it might catch our attention why it might be something that we are could be preoccupied with why are all those tv shows about ufos right why, and there why, are yeah, a lot there are of lots. those shows if you i mean just, you know so many channels out there but you kind of it's all about ancient aliens and aliens and where mm-hmm. and ufos and things that, mm-hmm. that uh we don't have a lot of real proof about but people mm-hmm. seem to be really gravitating toward those things and one element of the narrative that i think seems really important is that somebody knows something and isn't telling us there right. is an inherent there is a mystery inherent in the aliens themselves but also the possibility of somebody knowing something and not telling us right and the government keeping secrets right. from us that that's an ongoing mm-hmm. theme in lots of different ways but certainly around this for sure. and just as an aside uh i think they have a a very naive faith in the power of our government Right. to do anything properly and correctly. Right. And the idea that somehow they can maintain a secret such as this, for, I mean, I really think that is, you know, you're giving yeah, away, so too, you're, much, <laughs> giving away too much credit. It's not. I see where you're going. <laughs> They're so inept, they can't even keep That's, a secret. So I don't do know, you know. They can keep it now. So I really I think, that. you know, if history tells us anything, uh, <laughs> we would expect uh, <laughs> the cat would have been out of the bag a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, well, somebody would have found that. <laughs> Well, I d- I do remember that uh, Joe Rogan on his uh, podcast, the Joe Rogan Experience, had uh, a guy who worked at Area, Area 51, 51, and uh, I, I can't recall his name right now, but it, he uh, he identified a number of things going on there and sort of really supported the idea that the government had found something, had found bodies, had found aircraft, and so forth. Uh, the news, however, was always about, uh, you know, some aden- unidentified object and they found parts and metal and things like that. And that's as far as it got from the government side of it. Mm-hmm. I find it really interesting that when the topic came up, so many people responded. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the part where we're and, and um, if we haven't lost the two death row inmates at this point. Whoever else is listening, this is the part where we, we, we may lose them because I'm, okay. I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a creature of, of I'm a one trick pony, a creature of habit, and I have a certain way of looking at the you're world. Gonna, you're going to talk about psychoanalytic. I am, I am. I'm going to a psychoanalytic this, this exploration of Area okay. 51. I'm, I'm, and, I'm, I'm and, and good I, with that. And if I could sum it up in just one one phrase, which I hope we can unpack. Okay. Is that we have um, we have uh, we all know what Area 51 is. Okay. And it is mom. Okay, we can uh, end there if you'd like, and we That's stop there. Let it there go. go. Uh, Fifty one is mom. All right, you. <laughs> no, but you said unpack, so I think that's going to take just so a moment unpack, here yeah, for us unpack. to kind of figure that mm-hmm. out. There's something uh, sort of primal there going on with us. Well, and when we think about this, and there's this guy by name Jean Laplanche. Laplanche. Yes. I had to, I did, my French has oh, gotten that's, better. That's very French. Laplanche. Go. And uh, Jean Jean Laplanche is a um, a French. Actually, he's not. He's from Jersey. He's not. I'm kidding. kidding you know, no, it's right. typical. All right, go ahead. No, he's from no. France. And he has this notion of the, what he called the enigmatic object. Okay. And what he said is is, is, is that, um, you know, if you can think about the birth of subjectivity, the part of which you become, you begin to become you. And that begins um, probably somewhere in gest- gestation, certainly in birth, all that sort of stuff. Right. But it involves very early on a tight orbit between you and the maternal object. And that doesn't have to sure. be mom, but usually it's mom. Yeah, of course. So there is this dance that goes on, and, and, and it is um, just as mom is growing you, you're growing a mom. There's a mutual growing of each other that occurs in this sort of dance between baby and child. And Laplanche says... There's something about that, though, because the way we see both ourselves, the world, and the people in it are going to be um, affected by both the quality and quantity of that experience. Okay. But there are certain things that are certainly universal, regardless of quantity and quality. Okay. And that is, you as a nascent subjectivity, you as... as um, uh, someone whose nervous system is immature is in the presence of someone who has a mature nervous system and they generate a tremendous amount of mystery mom adults and thereby the entire world generates a certain enigma okay and this is where it gets even funkier because laplanche says not only are we then sort of um um mugged 
or the shadow of this enigmatic object falls across us and we are um, uh, jointly confused, whatnot, we are also enticed. We yeah. begin to sort of, um, we learn to not only it, it survive and to accept, but even to be invested in these dances of mystery. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to figure out some things in mm -hmm. these early stages, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of mystery. We don't know, and we're trying to, who is this object uh, mm -hmm. that's taking care of me? What is going on in the environment? And the building of the mm -hmm. own, their own uh, personality and structure mm -hmm. and so forth. So a lot of things to discover in that process. And we learn to begin to invest in those discoveries. So we have a, um, a hunger for mystery. So, and it's interesting because it, it um, if you watch, um, ever watched any of them in detective movies or read them in detective novels, you know, like that sort of thing, if you ever read them. That's my thing, man. You, you like, that's all, that's, uh, yeah, really? Got one going on right now. Really? So, so you, so you like to talk about that later, but. Uh, we'll, we'll notice how, you know, and, and there's certainly something satisfying about finding out the good killer, but the real satisfaction is in the chase, right? Yes. In the getting yes. lost, in, in, in settling into the rhythm of the enigma and to almost luxuriate in, in this, this experience. And Laplanche says, this is kind of inherent in, in who we are and how we came to be, and we begin to look for it everywhere. So on a cultural level, something like Area 51 is a way of restaging that very mystery. Right. On a cultural level, we need to be able to, um, to, uh, to, there needs to be something that we don't completely understand. And there's a second area to this, but there is someone who knows, and this is the part where it gets even freakier. Okay. If that, up, up oh no, no, I, I, I mean, I really followed you up mm -hmm. to this point, so you're about to lose me. But I I'll say, I'll say this, mark, mark this point, um, that these are the kind of things that that we gravitate toward. There's a mystery about it. Mm -hmm. We're sort of pulled toward mm -hmm. it in lots of ways, and it's about that. And if you find something mm -hmm. in Area 51, let's say, mm -hmm. it ends that in mm -hmm. some ways, I guess. Well, this is where Laplanche goes. We, we may not want to go full Laplanche on this, but okay. let's follow through. All right, go. Because the second part of it is, there's, first is the mystery, the enigma, but the second is someone who is supposed to know. And Laplanche figures that very early on, the child, you or me, mm -hmm. whoever, um, imagine yourself as a baby again in the presence of good yes. old mom. You are aware that there is someone outside the orbit that mom has another investment in, a different sort of investment. Mm -hmm. That she, you are the apple of her eye, but her desires also go somewhere else. Ooh. There is someone else outside that orbit, and there is a point at which you begin to, um, you begin to have a relationship with this other, the paternal figure. Okay. But before that happens, you, you, you swim with this enigma and this also someone who knows your mom in ways that you do not, mm -hmm. who knows things. So there are secrets and then there are keepers of secrets. And so this tension between mom and the big burgeoning connection with dad generates first the mystery and then the idea is somewhere out there. Right. Someone knows. Right, and it's a mystery to you, I mm -hmm. assume, in that point. And so, in some ways, you have, in Area 51, a, a wonderful constellation that sort of reflects all of our nascent uh, uh, subjectivities. You have the mystery, and then someone who is holding that from us. We have... We, does that make sense? Yeah, we did. That's okay, that, that, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's I mean, Laplanche. I really like uh, Laplanche. Uh, La Planche. That was, yeah. I was giving it a shot there. Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, and we're talking on a large scale. I think there were a million plus people that signed up for to. And think of how many people what watch the, these t the, the, the X Files. That was a popular show, right? Yeah, it was. That's uh, yeah, sure. that's uh, Scoldy and Mulder, whatever they were. <laughs> that's close enough. I'll that take that. I, I like mean, that like better that, actually. I know somebody but, had red uh, hair and somebody didn't, <laughs> and that was. Uh, but people watch that. People watch uh, You know, it, it, it is. It is. Um, and maybe even you can see with with some of the. Uh, uh, witchcraft, uh, fairy tales. There's often sort of a, a, there's something about this that is reverberated throughout history and in all different cultures. And the Planche wants to sort of, sort of touch on that. That part of what makes it reverberated, it, it is a dance we do with the world 
outside of us and the world inside of us, and it at least partly is a reflection of this this uh, subjective birth we have to go through in a dance both with a maternal object and later a paternal object. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, that, that can explain a, a lot of things. That this, this structure between the, the child or baby and the mother um, kind of set the stage for this to continue throughout their lives, mm-hmm. in other words. So what about the people who are not interested in Area 51, the ones who are – who could care less, or they're not, they didn't sign up on the internet to charge Area 51. Which they're dead inside. Sound like a. <laughs> they're just dead inside. No, no. Well, it's interesting because I was reading uh, this this thing last night about uh, there were some studies on folks who don't dream, and right. um, okay. about um, about ten to twenty five percent of the people out there, about one in two hundred fifty actually was one or two hundred fifty don't report dreams. They don't. And these are folks that typically, t- and, and it was interesting because they were looking at, they were more likely to have the engineer, uh, that have profession of engineering or something highly analytical. Okay, okay. So they tend to, you know, that they tend to dream, they, 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 so they... Right, um, right. They, they can also... Deconstruct things there. They also their have lives, their so. I- I- emotional, their emotional reactivity is narrower too. Okay, okay. So it is possible that if there was a continuum... The folks who are really hooked by Area 51, maybe they have a, um, they are um, not analytical enough. Maybe they are um, their capacity for affect regulation is um, is um, is a little, um, it's not as good. And okay. so what they generate is what's known as a paranoid system, because people who are really really focused on this, there's something out paranoic about the whole thing, right? Right. They're yes. aliens. They're keeping it from us. Right. Um, invasion of the body snatchers, all, kind of stuff. All the fears and um, mm-hmm. and the, the, the thrill and fear at the same mm-hmm. time. Those kind of things. So maybe we could draw a continuum, and we we might surmise that folks who are really caught up in this thing, man, they're they're like you know uh, they have some paranoid trends and whatnot, difficulty with affect regulation and modulation. And then on the other end, there are folks who may be more constricted. Okay. So we, we could almost maybe we could do an Area 51 test to determine where someone is on that continuum. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense. Mm-hmm. Well, the um, it, there's a fascination and a thrill to it that I think uh, people get swept up uh, with. And evidently, what you're saying is this was already in within that person and mm-hmm. it sort of ignites or mm-hmm. connects in some in some ways to that mm-hmm. thrill that fear mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. someone else knowing when you mm-hmm. don't know mm-hmm. and but that seems that, that one thread seems to be something that um is in our society the the lack of trust uh mm-hmm. in government that's a big thing now mm-hmm. no one can trust government anymore it seems kind of strange mm-hmm. uh it has to be some trust somewhere mm-hmm. so let me ask a question. If, there, if the person has been developed in a healthy way and they've mm-hmm. come along, they've had nurturing, they've Talk loved, about they, me. They, uh, <laughs> other than you, and they had uh, this, these kind of healthy uh, environment and mm-hmm. so forth and so on, uh, they may be less, have less of this or more of this. Where well, did they fall? Maybe we could say that they have a, um, they have a curious uh, interest um, they can have a skeptical – they can have just enough distance from their interest in this because one of the ways to sort of gauge um, if you found it fascinating, this Area 51, right. and that is different than uh, someone who puts on the tinfoil hat and believes that uh, the government is going to try to uh, uh, steal their soul and put it into some sort of alien who's I've currently – worn a tinfoil hat. I just want to say that for I, the record. Okay. Well, I have worn a tinfoil fedora because <laughs> if you're going <laughs> to – Hey, it's a pretty classy move there. That's a little, <laughs> it's a little advanced, but, uh, you know. Yeah, kind of get back to the 40s there. It's, it's, it's I like, the same I, time frame with this. Uh, your actually, I, if, you can, uh, if you can wear uh, any, any sort of pimp wear – that you can also See, combine with aluminum. I, you know, I hesitated to, to <laughs> mention that or trying to be a joke there, but then then you keep going. So I, yes, I will yeah. refrain for the rest of this <laughs> podcast um, and not do that. All right. So, yeah. So those people, what? They not interested in it. They, they well, have well, well, less capacity for Well, maybe that. we say that, that we, want, we, want, we want folks who have – um, at least a mild amusement okay. or the capacity for investment in it. Okay. Because I think a complete dismissal or a complete falling into it, the paranoid state, 
Maybe we want to find some way to between, be between those two points because, I mean, inherent in this and in Laplanche's notion of the enigmatic object is we have to cultivate a relationship with mystery. We want to be able to pursue it. We want to be able to feel some joy, some pleasure in, in, in the unknown. When you mention right. detective, that's what detective fiction does, right? It puts you in a place. Right. It generates mystery, and that you stay there as long as you can. And if the um, if the writer is good enough, he will continue to generate roadblocks. Right. He and so right. it delays the possibility of foreclosure as long as it can. So your capacity to live in that space and to find some sort of joy may be very important. Right. right. The paranoia gets lost in it. Someone who is, and maybe it's between the paranoid and the obsessive, because the obsessive would be someone who needs to have everything um, concise, sequential, um, and in that sense, they would dismiss mystery altogether. There's a, a, mm, um, okay. a um, I believe it's Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, who talks about disparagingly the, he calls them mysterians. Folks okay. who really want to who who want to preserve mystery, and he sees that as sort of, and I can understand his point. Yeah, but he but he sees really that you know that there are um, that they somehow have a love affair with mystery, and he sees that goes against the whole notion of logic. It goes against what you know right. science. Right. Well, um, yeah, because otherwise it's kind of a sterile environment here. There's mm. where, where are the mysteries and so forth. Um, mm. And I think, yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of reinforcement for that mm. and uh, the thrill of it and not really wanting to know. Mm. Let's say, for example, the government decided, hey, wait a minute, we've held on to this Area 51 too long now. Mm. We're going to open the gates. Mm. We're going to open the doors. You guys come in, mm. take a look at everything, take pictures, bring in whoever you want to. And so mystery. Uh, right. <laughs> Mis- no, no. Mystery's now settled. It's over yeah, yeah. with. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we're going to look for something else at that point? Here's Is what that w- what's going to happen? Here's what I would think. that. See, I think that would be the very wrong move because then it generates a different mystery. Why did they do this? Where Why has it been moved to? Oh, <laughs> what, you know, okay. What to, now, this mystery yeah. never ends. I'm uh, getting the feeling that uh, somebody would say, hey, they just did a show. They moved everything to another mm-hmm. spot. They're still not telling us the truth. Mm-hmm. And on and on it goes. Yeah, there's a famous, go famous forever, joke right? that uh, Freud tells about uh, these, these two uh, two guys uh, meet, and one their, the one guy's angry at the other, and he says, you know, um, uh, why did you say you were going to Berlin when you were going to Berlin? And the butt of the joke is, is that he was supposed to say he was going to Berlin, but he was actually going somewhere. But he was going to Berlin and told him he was going to Berlin. So in a way, if if uh, <laughs> it's maybe not as funny as it <laughs> no, could be. I'm just glad we have that on tape, so I, I can go back and and uh, rewind. And it's watch it's, that it's a little not bit that funny. But uh, yeah, did some some funny jokes. In fact, the number of penis jokes from Freud you would have come to expect them, I guess. But. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, he's Freud. Sometimes a yeah. cigar is a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> but um, um, the idea is, is that is it, it would be a little like that. Why are you telling me there's nothing in Area 51 when there's nothing in Area 51? It would right. really be, you know, it, it right. would open up a whole different, whole different thing. Like, what? Why are you doing this? You know? Okay. Mm. Okay. Well, it, it does seem to me that um, we've learned a lot about astrophysics and astronomy and uh, mm. the num- the billions of galaxies and billions of planets. But the cruise astrophysics. Uh, we need we need the cruise. He uh, puts on. the ass in astrophysics. I'm uh, just saying. Not, no, he, you did not say that. <laughs> sorry, did you, sorry, did sorry. you say that? Okay. <laughs> No, but um, the idea that we've learned that so many, so the possibility of mm-hmm. life on another planet or of, of mm-hmm. an advanced um, mm-hmm. alien race uh, mm-hmm. coming to Earth and us connecting and mm-hmm. all of those kind of things, uh, mm-hmm. that's an ongoing one. That seems to be connected. That's a probably a larger one than just the Area 51 in mm-hmm. some ways. Mm-hmm. That, that that mystery goes on and on. It goes, it goes. And, and you know, the, there are always those probings that go on, too, that I, I know that people are always telling about that. <laughs> I've got, you know, I, I haven't learned after all this, these years now uh, of not to set up the uh, joke well, that's coming. Know, I can I was, see that in advance. I cleaned I it up. Know. I had a really good one going, but I was like, nah, I won't go there. Cause, but it was really funny. Well, good, good. But it doesn't have to do with tell me, tell me afterwards. All right, there that's we go. That's right. But, uh, but so, so you, you, but, well, I think one way to think about this is when you, when you look up into the sky, sure. you know, the um, – 
there is um, there is a complexity there is a possibility there is what Kant called the sublime that there is something out there that is um, terrifying in its beauty it is something that um, that is both uh, awesome but uh, terrifying and right. that um, that is a position that we we were born into. We're born into a world that is always bigger than us, uh, smarter than us, and at least faster than us at the very beginning. As a child, we are born into this. Um, we are we are adrift in a world that uh, that is making us and that we have very little uh, uh, effect on, at least initially. And that Laplanche would say these are embedded that these become the maps we have of the world right. when we look up in the stars you know we, with that, that we see at least an echo or a mirror of reflection of our own subjectivity being born and in some ways that's reductive and solipsistic and any sort of criticism of cycling theory can say you know you're reducing it all to this mm -hmm. I, I think it's not a matter of simply reducing to that but it it allows you to sort of think about how uh, there is a um uh, a continuity, a developmental continuity between the things we experience as adults, Area 51, all throughout a life. They're mm -hmm. ubiquitous. They're woven through who we are and where we come from. And um, there's well, great merch around them, too. Yeah, well, it makes, uh, it, it makes sense. And the um, aliens, you know, when we have um, so many movies out, it seems like those alien movies always turns out to be some monster mm -hmm. in there. It's almost like a genre mm -hmm. of the of the horror film, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, you never see that movie where uh, maybe E. T. for example, but they came yeah. in friendly. That we developed as friends, and everything's what wonderful, you, and we're gonna. I always go thought that E. T. looked a lot like a ham. Didn't he look like just an un? <laughs> like if you opened up a canned ham, and maybe it's see, just me. It's see now. <laughs> Now that you've um, planted that in our heads, it does look uh, ham -like. It's going to be. <laughs> it's very, very hamish. But uh, my point was that mm -hmm. there was uh, there. It's always some horror or some terrible thing that's mm -hmm. going to happen. So mm -hmm. we're sort of slanted to mm -hmm. this um, this uh, um, fear horror side of it, as mm -hmm. opposed to. What's well, interesting because we talk about that. Someone and, like us coming and saying, "Hey, how are you?" And you think about just the notion of horror. But this could be something to talk about at some point too. There's yeah. another theorist by the name of Julia Kristeva. She's also French, by the way. What is it with these French people? I don't know, man. What? You're. Uh, They're cra They got these crepes. And they seem, got these crazy you theories. You seem to be bringing it up a lot. We'll talk about that on the <laughs> maybe show. I'm a Francophile. Isn't that, yeah. you, that's Francophile, okay, right? Okay, that doesn't but, sound uh, right at all. <laughs> but um, uh, she, had this, the, she has what's called the theory of the abject. And she says that to define ourselves, it's a little like when you're, when you're taking a cookie cutter. Um, foomp, to make the cookie in the outline of the person, there's so many other things you have to take away. And sure. so we, she says we have to render abject parts of ourselves render them negative to be able to create a cohesive positive right and so there are lots of things about ourselves and different cultures set different parameters on what the abject is yes uh, you can think of all sorts of bodily emissions all sorts of things about the human condition that are sort of like a clothing for instance nudity is seen as an element of the abject so all these sorts of things you know uh, in some cultures you know you you um uh, what if you how you blow your nose is determined, or what you do with mucus, all that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. there are all these elements of us, and she says that in in horror we have a return of the abject, that the very things that we've attempted to sort of push away from ourselves to define ourselves come back in a narrative form. Mm -hmm. um, she wants a wonderful example. Uh, actually, Zizek uses this example in talking about Christopher. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up Zizek. I did it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what is it? Me, I've, me. Got, I've got a scorecard over here. I Ding! It's a, <laughs> he says if you, 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 you can, um, most of us um, swallow, I think, uh, almost a gallon of saliva a day. Okay. Just no big deal. Yeah. When I say that, no big deal. But imagine you take that saliva, spit it into a cup, and then have to drink it. It becomes, you become nauseous. Yes. So there is an element of you that you've suddenly rendered abject, right? Right. It was and, yours. 
and it was <laughs> right you know <laughs> what's the problem <laughs> let's tell you but suddenly you you know you you get a little you get a little nauseous thinking about it right now <laughs> right. It's, as a matter of fact so, so, yeah. yeah yeah it's, it's not uh, it's not you know <laughs> but, uh, um, but we break off those parts of uh-huh. us that uh, for some reason we need to mm-hmm. in order to ha- to be whole and mm-hmm. you won't get that on the joe rogan show uh, I okay. bet he. Ne- I bet he hasn't even ever mentioned Julia Christopher. Um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna uh, <laughs> direct message him right now and uh, see if he's ever. No, and he's probably not. No, at least not in the context of saliva. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. Uh, absolutely. All right. So we're winding our way through um, these mysteries. We're mysteries. T- taking a, a part um, ourselves and discarding some parts to be whole. We're Maybe uh, in some way the defense mechanisms, we're, you know, in denial or suppression, mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. those kinds of things that may happen uh, in order to preserve mm-hmm. ourselves mm-hmm. in some ways and who we are. And notice how that there is a dance that goes on with this. When we pursue pleasure, and that's very different than, um, you know, um, um, when you, there's a difference between, um, uh, Lacan calls it jouissance, but so there is the pleasure of eating something. Mm-hmm. Right. So, for instance, if you're hungry, you know, you could uh, in the future, there may be some sort of small protein um, uh, wafer that you could chew and it would you would for the whole day. You're fine. Well, that would be pleasant in the sense that you would be assuaging hunger pains. Right. But true pleasure, which is pleasure. Jewissance has an excess. That is where. Wait a minute. I'm going to wait for a couple hours and I'm going to go down to um, um uh, that Italian restaurant that has the unlimited breadsticks, and I'm going to eat right. myself sick. Okay. You know, uh, there's a big leap between those two points. And having a restaurant with commercials, unlimited breadsticks, all that sort of stuff, there's a big leap between simply the satiation of a desire and true pleasure. Uh-huh. And so, all of these things in mystery that we danced with when we were in in our earliest stage of us, we find a way to be able to play them out right. in mystery novels. So you're finding a way, you, you find Jewissance in that. You find an, mm-hmm. an excess pleasure in being able to take something that at some point may have been uncomfortable and find a way to play it out in a book that you know that at some point you can put down, it finds its way there. In, um, Come back in, to it, mm, move back to it. So Freud was big on this, that we often take like um, uh, the very things that are abject may find themselves into, um, into our sexuality. Uh, into um, uh, the uh, uh, between two consenting adults, mm-hmm. you uh, can engage in all sorts of activities that if you did those in public or if you talked about them at church would get you in lots of trouble or you'd be, but within that confine, the object can return in a way that can be pleasurable. Okay. You know, things that uh, are slightly nauseating or over the top are less so when they're in that context. So whether it's detective novels or your honeymoon, there is a way in which you are finding a way to play with mystery and the abject, you know. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I, it, it's. Uh, and by the way, that abject would really describe my honeymoon. I'm just oh, saying. I, this is not a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might have seen me smile uh, at that moment, knowing that that joke was coming. Um, I've also, I've got. So, I, I'm selling videos, so if you, you know, you could, you could actually be witness to that event if you want. Just saying. Okay. Well, you know, it's all about merch. Uh, it they is. Say, so, yeah, that's uh, that's some merch, all right. That's good. So, um, yeah. So, really, you've sort of broken this down for us a little bit, but I'm not sure that you're not. You're right. This hasn't been mentioned on Joe Rogan's. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think the regular guy on the street uh, has broken this down in that way. But <laughs> no, no. But, it, but it begins to explain this Area 51 idea. Now, mm-hmm. you started out by saying, "Let's go back to the beginning mm-hmm. here." That um, Area Fifty One was mom. Area we, okay, we have one all, more time here. Yeah. Let's go back. What happened? Well, because because the the notion of mystery, the notion of something that someone knows something that they're not telling you, um, the idea that there is um, there is something potentially dangerous but also enticing, these are inherent in our very very first relationships, and that's usually with a maternal object. Mom is a mass of mysteries. She is. She, um, the things she wants, the things she doesn't want. Um, you know, Laplanche talks about this too, that, you know, there are different levels of communication. And we often will say to someone, you know, hey, I want you to do this. 
but there's a subtle intonation that actually I really don't want you to do this, and that you know to to move in language and to communicate with each other, there are all these there are these tensions and mysteries inherent in that, and they they find their play. So the very if we were to distill Area Area Fifty One into just a a series of uh, of experiences and enticements, uh, the conflicts that are inherent in it, we would just make a list. We would find that same list in Mom, you know. And I, I had a paper I gave a few years back at um, at the International Zizak Conference, of all things, okay. in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I fell while playing disc golf and hurt my wrist. Never been the same. Never been the same. Right. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm it's not just following a, up on any of that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's a, but I had a paper, and one of the lines in the paper was, you know, we've all met Cthulhu. Cthulhu is mom. Do you know who Cthulhu is? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. H.P. Lovecraft, tentacle face thing, giant monster. Okay. okay. No, no. All okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. Ring a okay. Bell, well, yes, it was, no, I haven't. It was, it was a paper on black metal. I was doing a thing on black metal, and, and, um, and um, you know, one of the Your things. Topic areas for these conference <laughs> presentations. Um, yeah, they're they're good. I'm a, um, I need to sign up for more of these. It sounds <laughs> you should, like you really should, interesting should. topics. Uh, actually, my last one at the International GJAC Conference in Athens, Georgia, was "Is Taylor Swift Evil?" That was the name of the paper I presented. You put that as a title. <laughs> Is Taylor Swift Evil? And uh, I'm sure. Have you heard anything from her? Uh, no, no, no. It was, or PR it was, camp it was, or you know, any of the it, managers or uh, something. But okay. It, it was about. It was about is popular culture inherently um, problematic? Okay. Is there I something it. about right. the you know the back, um, right that that was sort of you know and I wanted to be able to and I, my conclusion is actually opposite that um, that it is our capacity for aestheticization our capacity to do something with the things that we're given not necessarily the object themselves so for instance there is a way to find a universe in taylor swift right. um, um you know you certainly people may be more easily find a universe in beethoven but mm -hmm. it depends on how one approaches it so it's sort of a call for sort of a um an attempt at um at universal aestheticization we got off on the wrong topic there. Sorry, but that no, was that, right. was that was that was uh, that was that, that was that was. But yes. the first one I did was there's a, there's a genre called cosmic horror. Ever heard of cosmic horror? I'm not familiar. Okay, it's this notion in Lovecraft. Um, H.P. Lovecraft was a writer in um, uh, 20s and 30s, I think. Uh, he might have. Uh, I think he died somewhere in the 30s and 40s. I think uh, he was uh, he was a writer for uh, one of these pulp magazines called Weird Tales. And uh, he created his own sort of mythos, and it was a world of um, of these aliens who were uh, so powerful, and we were so minuscule in the face of them mm -hmm. that uh, they don't, we were like ants, fleas to them. Right. And uh, he set up this this way of thinking about a world in which the universe not not it isn't that the universe is is against us; it just doesn't care. Right. And um, so it, there's this genre called cosmic horror that sort of play into that. I was trying to think of some films that might be within that uh, uh, realm. Uh, um, some of do you ever Stranger Things, see the TV show? Sure. That has some elements of cosmic horror. The characters, right. the the mind flare is sort of Lovecrafty in a way. Mm -hmm. And then it, you have the you know the giant thing at the end that uh, I don't know if you've seen the second season, third season, or third season. Third season, I have not seen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm two episodes away from the end of it. Okay. You know, it's I'll, not. Uh, I'll start catching up. Soon. It's not. Uh, you know, I uh, uh, it 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 would. I really think it took away from it when um, Jerry Seinfeld turns out to be the monster. I don't know if you. Uh, <laughs> Not a uh, that worst cameo. Did not happen. <laughs> yeah, it did, it He's didn't. too busy driving comedians around in cars. I understand. Mm. And so, he, uh, he delivers the final line. I would have gotten away from with this if it weren't for you crazy kids. Are you? <laughs> well, what's the line? Scooby Doo, you know Scooby Doo. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's all right. We're going. <laughs> so I think we just covered. I mean, most we comic books a lot of have things. been out. We here. All right. We'll, we'll come back. We'll come back to that. But yeah. So the unfeeling uh, monster. It's doesn't like care. and it's, it's, it's huge. It's like you know, like Cthulhu is like Godzilla sized, and he's he's just sort of. And there are these there's these forces at work that we're just simply just sort of the playthings of, you know. Right. Right. Again, uh, sounds like my wedding night. Put a boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom. Yeah. Speaking of cosmic horror, you know, uh, if I were, uh, 
you know, if our podcast grows at some point, we're going to have one guy with a uh, snare drum and uh, ching, da, da, don't pow, you know, one of yeah, those that's things. That's what she said. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, we're it. not going to. <laughs> we're not going there, are we? All right. So, all right. Well, you, you've um, you've given us a lot to think about in terms of this Area mm-hmm. 51 and what it really relates to us on a psychoanalytic and sort of deeper level of understanding and how we, why we gravitate toward those things. You know, the, 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 there's a flip soil. side of this too. You have to be careful because. One uh, one can get so lost in theory that one can lose sight of the world in which you, you, where you're, you're walking in. Sure. So it isn't that Area 51 couldn't contain these mysteries right. or that there aren't aliens. If we simply dismiss it as just an echo of our early subjectivity and the birth of our subjectivity, we w- what we should do is we should be able to – to make use of where we come from to inform and maybe even generate pleasure in the present day. You know, Mm -hmm. um, um, all the ways in which we were frustrated or things didn't work out um, have generated just the sort of tensions that we could find and the things we enjoy. Your interest in detective novels. If we put you on the couch and begin to talk to you, we might find some some interesting precursors in your childhood that might, that might, uh, what you look for when you pick up a detective novel. It might be interesting. You know, what what would it, you know, uh, what sort of, and there are different genres that there's hard-boiled detective, there is uh, the British detective, there's a, different genres. There are the, uh, Police um, procedurals. Procedurals. That's yes, right. Yes. And what, what? And what do you prefer? Um, I whatever's next in the author's <laughs> list that I haven't read. So. So, but but, but who the who would be an author that you're like really a? Um, well, now you put me on the spot there. I have to think of uh, <laughs> okay, this okay, one. So. But um, so generally, I, uh, they are police detectives. That's the latest one though. But mm-hmm. we've been through a number of different mm-hmm. uh, genres in there. Anything involved yeah. cats that solve crimes. Yeah. No, no cats. No cats in, well, our, yeah. in our novel. Sue uh, Grafton, the point. ABC yeah, the Grafton, mysteries. Yeah, yeah that, that, that involves a cat, doesn't it? There's a cat in there somewhere. Okay, that's, I'll <laughs> take so. your word for it. Okay. All right, I'm about to get in trouble here. I can't rem- <laughs> I'm going to have to bring my list of Maybe books it, next time. I, I don't so know if I'm you like that. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, is it Man Keller, the guy from um, one of the Swedish crime novels? Yes, yes. I, uh, I, 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 uh, I think my mother in law gave me a bunch of those and I read them, and they're they're very bleak. Very bleak. It's always <laughs> ice cold, uh, very, yeah, snowy. People. He's, uh, he's you know. like, you know, got uh, pancreatitis and doesn't want to get out of bed. And <laughs> there's all these things going on. I'm like, wow, I thought Sweden was a socialist paradise. What's going on here? <laughs> no. You know? It turns out What's, that it's ABBA, not. This is not, the ABBA did not prepare me for this. No, it's not, you know? not the same anymore. Uh, the bodies are always frozen under the that's ice. Right, it's, so it's, so it's, that's right. Yeah, not it's good. not a... You never uh, see. <laughs> all right, this has been interesting. I don't know how we pulled this back uh, mm-hmm. exactly, um, and I don't even think I'm going to try it because uh, <laughs> well, he, 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 I've here, done here's this our before. Takeaway. Here's the takeaway. So, I'll, I'll reiterate. The takeaway is this. All right, here we go. I want to be able to find a way to find joy and pleasure in mystery, the enigma, the enigma of the things. It's un, the the unsolvability or at least the tension toward being able to solve a thing would can create for us a journey that is that is full of all sorts of pleasures it is in the picking up and reading of a detective novel that we find many things and so i think an interest in area 51 and an interest in all these sorts of things whatever esoteric thing they may be uh, people are often interested in serial killers for instance mm. and part of that is because the serial killer represents a remarkable example of the return of the abject the parts of us that we, you know, we the the parts that we find in a serial killer, are the parts of ourselves that we have cut away and we want to project into the serial killer and then have a relationship with, through this this aesthetic distance, through the medium of literature, we have a way of dancing with ourselves and the, having the pleasure of that dance. Same with Area Fifty One. Well. I, I do th- I do think there's some fun in all of this and mm-hmm. having all of these interests out there and whether or not they're uh, mm-hmm. a little dangerous, uh, as it were, and getting in touch with ourselves uh, mm-hmm. sounds a little more, more like theory than just the mm-hmm. pleasure in and the And also, if you're Catholic, it's not, you're not supposed to do that and you can go blind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to leave it right there. Boom. Um Dan, thanks for coming in. I'll see you next time.